thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers of this conference to give me the opportunity to to, to, to talk about the, the way uh, we can measure and follow quantum trajectory uh, in uh, experiments where uh, we are able to count uh, single photons uh, in a cavity. So the kind of experiment uh, I need to talk to you about are experiments where one can observe uh, single isolated uh, quantum sing systems and uh, uh, the two uh, prototypes of such system are obviously the trapped ions <laughs> uh, in which for the first time quantum jumps were observed by observing the fluorescence of a single trapped ion people were able to see the jump between various uh, levels of barium ions for which there were either a high fluorescence rate or no fluorescence at all. Uh, th then, uh, kind of long time later, uh, we were able to perform the same kind of experiments uh, with photons by using trapped photons. So we, we were able to uh, observe a similar uh, quantum jumps with uh, photons with a small field trapped uh, inside the cavity. And the, the subject of the talk is to, uh, to I, I, is the way, uh, the various way one can use in order to reconstruct the, the field evolution, the quantum trajectory in a single realization where we prepare some field and observe it repeatedly uh, with atoms. So I will start with the first uh, introductory section about uh, general tools for reconstructing a, a quantum uh, state uh, uh, in general. And uh, I think the, the basic uh, scheme was already uh, presented uh, yesterday. The scheme we use uh, is uh, some kind of indirect measurement scheme in which one prepares a system in some uh, state which is either known or unknown. We make it interact with the meta, with some density matrix. Initially, the system uh, is uh, uh, in a separated uh, state. And after interaction, one gets some joint density operator for describing the system. So in general, this joint operator is entangled. There are correlation between the two states. And once one measures the meta, and we assume that we perform a projective measurement of the meta, so we apply standard quantum mechanics there, <laughs> one finds some result, and conditional to this result, the, the, we, one gets a new density matrix for the system, which is conditioned on the measurement result. And the general question uh, we want to address is how to operate this, how to optimize measurement in order to get the best possible knowledge about the quantum state uh, of the system uh, when uh, is observing. So there are several ways to uh, collect information on one system. One way consists in preparing a lot of time the same system in <coughs> the same way <coughs> and performing a sequence of measurement at some time uh, t of evolution after preparation. So one can reconstruct the state in the, same, in the sense of an ensemble average by taking all the data vertically on this scheme, all measurement just after t, and uh, then one can perform uh, reconstruction by quantum state tomography. Uh, sorry. So that's not the kind of reconstruction I will tell you uh, about today. We, we perform uh, reconstruction of, of quantum states like Schrodinger cast states or number states in the cavity, but I will not focus on that in this talk, and I will rather uh, talk about horizontal uh, interpretation of the data in which one prepares at some initial time some initial state of the system to be measured. One performs a long sequence of measurement, and sometime t after preparation, the question is to know what is the best estimate of the density operator of the system at that time. So that is the that is the what we do when we want to reconstruct a quantum trajectory by reconstructing this uh, quantum state at different time 
after a different number of measurements. So this uh, scheme in which one takes all the information available before time t is what we call the standard approach in which we just project repeatedly the initial density operator of the system in order to get the estimation at time t. So the other approach that I will focus on today consists in estimation the density operator at some time t and I will uh, tell later more precisely wha what I mean by that estimating the density operator of this, uh, at the time t, knowing not only the past, the measurement before uh, time t, but also the future, wha what uh, were the measurement results after time t. And so that's the so-called uh, past quantum state approach, which was uh, introduced uh, by Molmer in uh, 2013, and that uh, we will apply now to the kind of measurement uh, that we perform. So to go further, uh, I will uh, specify more precisely what happened and how to describe a, a generalized quantum measurement, the indirect measurement scheme I already presented uh, before. So the density operator of the system before measurement have a simple expression in terms, uh, so th this conditional density operator has a simple expression as a function of the initial one and some operators M that I will uh, call measurement operators, or which are named Kraus operator, which uh, uh, indeed can uh, describe any kind of measurement. So that's the generalized uh, measurement theory, which states that there is exists a set of operators, M, uh, verifying just this uh, property, uh, which is a normalization uh, relation, which allow one to describe completely what happened in this measurement. So this formula describes what happened to the density operator of S, and that formula tells you what is the probability to get the result m in the measurement of uh, this uh, set of operators. So I will use this formalism uh, to describe uh, all measurement and the way one gets information about the system by performing repeated measurements. So I want to stress uh, several properties of this kind of evolution. Of course, it, it, describes, it, it describes the measurement we perform uh, in the experiment, but indeed it describes all kinds of evolution. In particular, it also describes unitary evolution, which can be seen as a measurement which has only one result, which is certain, and whose uh, operator is just the uh, evolution operator uh, of the system. It also applies for describing uh, relaxa relaxation processes. Uh, in the general uh, theory of relaxation, uh, you know that one can consider that a measurement, uh, a relaxation, cannot always be modeled uh, by interaction with some larger quantum system, a current evolution uh, of the system and the larger environment, and then the uh, effect of relaxation on the system density matrix can be always seen as an unread measurement. So a measurement is described by that, and a an unreached measurement it just uh, uh, can be described just by averaging the final density operator over all possible unread results. So it means that this expression of evolution of the system uh, as a function uh, of, uh, of time can always be uh, uh, used for describing any kind of quantum processes, uh, measurement, unitary evolution, but also relaxation, which can be uh, described by measurement operators. So let us uh, go uh, uh, more precisely to the standard approach of quantum tra trajectory, which consists in using uh, the measurement result before time t in order to estimate the quantum state of the system at time t. And I just iterate uh, the previous formula here to all measurements before uh, time t in order to get the density operator of the system of type T, which is a conditional density operator, by all measurements M1 to M J. And the iteration uh, uh, leads to this uh, expression where we have the initial density operator sandwiched with measurement operator in the order of apparition in time and the agent on the other side. So once one gets this operator, one knows everything in principle, what one can know on the system, 
and one can describe the measurement of any other operator that would be performed uh, on the system at time t. So let's assume that we measure some observable O at time t. This is again described by a set of generalized uh, measurement operators. And uh, for example, the probability to get the result, the eigenvalue O and this I for the operator O is given by this formula, <coughs> which use just the density operator of the system at time t. So now the past quantum state approach consists in uh, asking a different question, a different, uh, and calculating another uh, conditional probability. So the question we answer with uh, using the past quantum state is the conditional probability or the co conditional probability to get some measurement result for the operator O, knowing all measurements performed on the uh, system either before or after T. So this conditional probability is well defined and the, the, the past quantum state is a formalism uh, which applies to calculate this conditional probability which takes into account not only information on the system before uh, measurement but also after measurement. So you can feel uh, 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 this as kind of counterintuitive because you could ask the question, okay, why to use the future in order to get information at time t. But that's indeed something we always do in, in, in the current life. For example, if you consider some ev event with the journalist point of view, you only know the information at time t where, where you write your paper. But if you are an historian, you, you look at the same event later and you can tell more because you know more about the consequence of, of what happened at t. Here it's exactly the same. If you know more about the system, even if it's later, a posteriori, you can uh, kind of retrodict by post-selecting measurement, it's kind of post-selection, things about the system at time t. So more precisely, what is the, the object for describing formally this uh, past quantum, quantum state conditional probability? So the conditional probability is here. It is similar to the previous formula, except that now we include all measurement until the end of the story. And formally, the first part of the expression looks like before. It's the measurement operator corresponding to O times the density operator at time t. So this density operator is the same as before. And the change in this E operator, which is called the effect matrix by, by Moltmann, and which contains all the information one gets in the future of the uh, time t. So rho s, I remind you the expression I have just on the previous slide here, with the initial density operator and the measurement operators and measurement results here uh, as indexes. So the effect matrix have a similar expression, except that instead of propagating the initial states, one propagates what is not a final state, but a unit operator, and one propagates it backwards by using the measurement result occurring after time t. So you see that here, uh, this uh, involves uh, the measurement. I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake when putting the indices. Here it should be k, and here it should be uh, j plus 1. So the other difference is that if you compare the two expressions, they involve the same measurement operator, except that you have exchanged the uh, agent and, and the original operator. And that's a, a general uh, way for describing a backward propagation of an evolution. You use basically the same measurement operator as in the forward evolution, but you have to use the adjoint uh, to get the, the right expression. Which means that you can uh, uh, indeed retrodict the state, not only using the measurement result, but also uh, using the all information you have the system. Indeed, you can also, and you should also, include relaxation in this measurement operator. And as I told you, relaxation is unread measurement and can be included in this uh, formalism. So I, I go now uh, to the experimental uh, realization uh, uh, using a microwave photon uh, stored in a high-Q cavity and in our experiment. So I will not uh, give you much details because you probably already heard about uh, it. We observe a field stored in a cavity, which is a generic realization of an oscillator system by sending two level atoms, which is a generic uh, realization of a spin 
system. And by looking at a collection of atoms interacting successively with the cavity, we will uh, apply this past quantum state formalism in uh, order to get the best possible knowledge of the field in the cavity uh, at time t. So the two level atoms are circular Rydberg atoms. Rydberg atoms are huge atoms. When you make them circular, they have a, a much longer lifetime with respect to low angular momentum Rydberg atoms. And uh, they, uh, their, their lifetime uh, is in the range of 30 milliseconds. And the atom is huge. It has a large dipole, so it is strongly coupled uh, to microwave. And in the experiment, we are dealing with the uh, Rydberg level with principal quantum number 50 and 51, and the transition frequency 51 uh, gigahertz. So my microwave photons are stored in the experiment in IQ superconducting cavity. <coughs> that uh, uh, allow one to store the photons for long times as long as 130 milliseconds, which corresponds to the time needed by light to make about one round trip uh, uh, around the Earth, so that the uh, highest uh, possible uh, storage time uh, for photons, I think, in, in any kind of frequency range. And this time scale have to be compared to the time scale of individual measurement, which is the interaction time with a single atom. So in, in the present experiment, Rydberg atoms are fast Rydberg atoms crossing the cavity at thermal velocity. And the corresponding interac interaction time is in the range of tens of microseconds, so which is very small as compared to that time. It means that we can uh, send and detect hundreds or thousands of atoms before the, the relaxation occurs and before the photon disappears. So we can perform repeated measurement at a rate much faster than the damping rate uh, of the system. So the uh, wool setup uh, looks like this. So an atomic beam of circular Rydberg atom crossing the high Q uh, superconducting cavity placed at the center. Once the atoms have interacted with the cavity, they get correlated with the cavity state. And one gets, in this experiment, information about the cavity field by detecting the atom one by one, by ionizing them. For one atom, one gets one electron, and it's easy to count electrons. And the ionization threshold depends on the state. It's easier to ionize the upper state. So when you vary the electric field, you first uh, ionize the E state and then the G state. And by looking at a detection time of electrons, you can not know atom by atom uh, in which state it was at the end of the experiment, which means that you extract one bit of information per atom. So what is the way to get information, the, the physical interaction process which provides interaction uh, and information about the cavity state? It basically consists in building an atomic clock around the cavity. So before and after the atom cross the cavity, we have low Q cavity in which we apply classical pi over 2 pulses to the two-level atom to prepare a superposition state of E and G, so the state, let's say, E plus G. And this superposition state will oscillate at the eigenfrequency of the atom, so that's a clock. And uh, you will see that the presence of photon in the cavity will eventually change the rate of the clock, which is measured by, again, comparing the atomic clock with an external clock uh, in a second uh, pi over 2 uh, Ramsey pulse. So inside the cavity, uh, we use the dispersive interaction between the two-level atom uh, and the, the, the microwave field stored in the cavity. So there is here, uh, on this picture, uh, 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 of rest state, the uh, 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 splitting uh, due to the detuning between E and G. And the non-resonant interaction ensures that energy conservation implies that the photon number is conserved during the interaction. So we'll perform a quantum and demolition measurement of the photon number. So if there is a photon or n photon in the cavity, levels E and G will experience opposite light shift proportional to the photon number. And so it means that the rate of the clock when the atom crosses the cavity is affected by the presence of photons. And here, for example, the atom will oscillate a little bit faster depending on the photon number. So as a result of this faster oscillation, uh, the atom will accumulate some phase shift when crossing the cavity. So more precisely, the atomic clock works like this. The pi over 2 pulse perform a rotation of the spin equivalent to the atom represented here on the block sphere, so that I prepare here 
the, the red state uh, superposition of E and G with equal weight, which oscillates at the atomic frequency. So in a rotating frame at the frequency of the free atom, nothing happened, except when the atom crosses the cavity. Due to light shift, you, you will have a phase shift of the atomic spin, effective spin related to the atom, so that after interaction, for example, here is a phase shift induced by a single photon is pi over 4, which is realistic. You have a spin which may point is four in eight different directions, depending on the photon number in the cavity. Now the atom has left the cavity, so it does not change anymore the field, and you can read out this information. The way to read it out is to apply a second pi over 2 pulse, which will perform a rotation of the equator of the block sphere along some direction. And this direction is set by the phase of this second Ramsey pulse. So you can change the direction of rotation, so the direction of measurement, uh, by choosing this phase. And once the rotation is applied, one measures the EG population, which amounts to the measurement of sigma z of the spin. One measures the spin along the vertical axis. And you see that, for example, if there is one photon, there is a much higher probability to get E uh, in the end as compared to the case where there are five photons in the cavity. So from this correlation, you get information about the field, and you get it atom by atom. And you have uh, an adjustable parameter for uh, performing the measurement, which is the phase of the Ramsey field, which uh, allows you to choose which direction or which photon number you align along the measurement axis. So let's now apply uh, the general measurement formalism for describing what occurs in a single uh, such measurement, which may have two results. So G has a value either E or G. And of course, this is described by measurement operators, which are uh, written here, which involve as operator only the photon number. So these measurements are conserving uh, the photon number. And this sine and cosine, which will appear as squared in the density uh, in the final uh, expression of S, uh, are nothing else that the sine and cosine involved in usual Ramsey fringes. It's interference signals, which depend on the phase shift, uh, on the phase uh, of the uh, second pi over 2 pulse phi r, so the phase in the Ramsey interferometer, and on the phase shift induced by the number of photons. And here I introduce the phase shift per photon uh, phi zero. So we'll uh, assume that uh, the initial density matrix is diagonal because nothing depends on of, uh, on, uh, of diagonal elements of this density matrix in this measurement. And so I will just uh, discuss now first a simpler uh, description in terms just of the photon number distribution P of n, which is just the diagonal matrix element of the density operator. So what occurs during a single measurement the previous uh, formula can be rewritten uh, uh, just uh, <coughs> as a formula linking probabilities and conditional probabilities, and this is nothing else than the base law, which tells you that after a measurement, the new photon number distribution, which is a conditional photon number distribution, which depends on the measurement result and on the setting of the measurement, the setting of the Ramsey interferometer, is the initial, so the photon number distribution just before the measurement, multiplied by this conditional probability, which is the reverse of that one, the probability to get G, knowing that there are n photons in the cavity and that the setting uh, is the same, of course. And the, the denominator is just a normalization factor. So this tells you that after measurement, the photon number distribution favors the photon number which, get a which correspond to large probability to get the effective result find the, the, the result G. More precisely, let's just assume that we find the result E, and that the initial photon number distribution have no information, so it is just a flat distribution like this. Then, after a, a measurement leading to the result E, I have to use this conditional probability, which is the square of, 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 of that, more or less, where you, you uh, replace N by the photon number. And uh, so you multiply it by which is the Ramsey fringe signal, and so you uh, just favor photon numbers with high uh, probability of this result, and uh, you reduce the probability to get the other. So you see that you have a strong modification of the photon number distribution in this process of getting information, 
you change the photon number distribution, but I should stress that you don't change the photon number itself. You have not observed, absorbed any photon. It's just that you have more information about the initial state, which was here unknown. Of course, you have some probability to detect the other state, which will modify the photon number distribution just in the opposite way. So that on average, you have unchanged photon number distribution. That's a quantum non demolition uh, measurement. So we cannot repeat this with many atoms before, because, of course, if you want to measure a photon number between 0 and 8, you cannot do it with a single bit. You need, at most, a free bit of information. Indeed, in the experiment, we need more. And what we do is to accumulate information by sending a lot of successive atoms. Here is the number of detected atoms, which varies from 0 to 100. And here is the inferred photon number distribution using the, uh, iterating the, the process I just presented. So you have initially a flat photon number distribution. We don't know, need uh, to, to know the initial photon number distribution to get the, the measurement result. And you see that after iterating the, 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 the measurement, after about detection of 50 atoms, one photon number wins over all the others. In this particular realization of the experiment, the photon number was five, was projected uh, on five photons in the experiment. And this uh, demonstrates what we call the pro progressive projection of the quantum state of the field on a, a, a number state, which was five in this experiment. Indeed, the initial photon number was not fly, flat. It was a, a coherent field involving 3.7 photons. So how do I know that? There are some calibrations in the experiment, but I can use this kind of signal to get this information by repeating the experiment a lot of time. Once it's converged to five, the other time to four, three, two, o other photon number. And the statistics of the results just reconstruct the photon number distribution of the initial state. So that's the statistics of, of the result of, the, of, of measurement. Uh, on a, a large number of identical realization of the experiment. So that's the ensemble average. That's not a trajectory average. And you see the red bars are, are the signal. And uh, the blue line is a fit uh, with a Poisson law corresponding co to a coherent state initially injected in the cavity. We inject a small field in the cavity with a synthetizer that we attenuate. And uh, when you attenuate a, a synthetizer, the field radiated in the cavity is always a coherent field down to vacuum. So the fit is very good. The only discrepancy is for uh, the measurement of vacuum. So you, you can wonder why vacuum is not so good, because it has the longest lifetime. But indeed, it's not that it is not good. It is that vacuum is also eight photons. And you can see that because we perform measurement modulo eight. And you can see that the probability to have eight photons is not non-zero. And it just corresponds to the excess of zero, which is, in fact, uh, eight uh, in, in this experiment. So that's uh, what I would say just about ensemble average of measurement result. And I will not now focus on following a quantum trajectory. So instead of repeating the measurement 50 times, which is the, the number of atoms needed to project the state uh, on a given quantum number, I will proceed on a much longer uh, time scale. And I will apply the, the standard and then the past quantum state uh, uh, formalism. So I remind you the main result of the past quantum state formalism, which is the pr conditional probability of finding the result OI in the measurement of the O operator at time t, knowing or conditional to all measurement results before and after t. With here the usual density operator, here the measurement operator cons corresponding to the observable O, and here this famous effect matrix, which is calculated in a similar way as rho, but starting from the end of the story, uh, starting with a unit uh, uh, operator and applying measurement operator. So I apply it now, this uh, to the photon number measurement. So now O becomes the photon number, and uh, the measurement operators become projector on photon number. And I just rewrite this formula. So the calculation is, is, is simple. When you take the trace using projection operator, only the diagonal elements of rho and e survive, which is a, a, a big simplification, which means that you can get the path quantum state photon number distribution just multiplying these two uh, diagonal elements of these two uh, operators. 
And then you can deduce from this expression the, the expression of various probabilities, which are interest for us. Let's first define what I will call the forward uh, estimation of the photon number, which is just the diagonal element of the density operator. So that is what is provided by the standard approach of quantum trajectory, where you only use the past information uh, that, that you get. No, note that uh, in, in the forward estimation, we take not only into account the projective measurements, but also relaxation between measurements, which can be described by, uh, by measurement operators as unread measurements. In, in practice, indeed, we describe it with the usual master equation uh, describing a damping uh, of the cavity field in the photon number basis. So the second uh, interesting probability distribution is the backward uh, uh, probability dis uh, distribution, which corresponds to uh, the diagonal element of this effect matrix that I assume that has been normalized uh, to, to unity. And then uh, the, 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 the effect matrix is uh, calculated, uh, as I told you, uh, in a similar way as, as rho, except that we, part we, we start with a flat distribution at the end, which means that we do not assume additional knowledge uh, for uh, taking into account the, the future of the measurement. The measurement operator are the same as before, but we have to invert the, the, the measurement operator on this agent. And we use inverse relaxation. And it can be established using uh, the, the, the Krauss operator formalism of relaxation that when you want to calculate backward relaxation, you use the adjoint of the usual uh, cross operators. You put this in the usual uh, master equation, and you get the correct e e equation for back propagating the, the system, including relaxation. So this, uh, thi this works uh, very nicely. And then I define the, the third probability, which is the most interesting for me, which is I will call the forward-backward uh, probability, which is just the product of the two others divided by the normalization. And doing this product is the re rigorous way to calculate the conditional probability of measurement result at t, knowing uh, the future uh, and the past. So it's just uh, the product of this uh, distribution. It's simple. Uh, to calculate. And uh, one can uh, remark that in this case, where we only involve diagonal elements of the various operators, the path quantum state approach reduces to another approach which is older and well known, which is a so called forward backward smoothing algorithm. Note that here the formalism developed by uh, Klaus Molmer uh, rigorously shows that this. Uh, uh, the, the use of this uh, classical algorithm is, uh, is authorized and is well established in the quantum context, context. So let's look first at the forward probability distribution, one inferred uh, for the measurement. So it's the standard approach of quantum tra trajectory. So here we started with some field injected in the cavity, which was a, a small coherent field. We do not assume uh, any a priori knowledge about it. So initially, the photon number distribution is flat. And uh, I represent as a function of time the average photon number deduced from the density operator estimated at time t. So you see several uh, well-known interesting features of quantum measurement. The first step, I already focused about it when showing you what happened during the detection of the 51st atom. It's a progressive collapse on an initially unknown system into a pure <coughs> photon number state. And in this particular trajectory, we find five, five photons in the cavity. Then, once the system is projected, there, there is a flat uh, uh, region where the, the photon number does not evolve in spite of damping. It does not evolve because you have repeated measurements which repeatedly find the same result. And after some time, relaxation occurs, but it occurs in the form of a quantum jump between discrete photon number, because the measurement is always projecting on photon number, and then damping can only appear uh, as jumps. And uh, in the end, the succession of quantum jumps drives the system uh, to vacuum. So that's the standard uh, description of the quantum trajectory. It is indeed somewhat limited. And uh, the limitations are, uh, are more manifest if I look 
at a larger field with a larger photon number initially. So let's look at the same kind of signal, evolution of photon number distribution as a function of n. And here, uh, it is represented in a little bit different way. So the horizontal axis is still time. But then uh, we encode with this color code the photon number distribution. So when uh, you have black here, it means that you are nearly sure that there is exactly one photon in the cavity. And, and the green side tells you how wide is the photon number distribution. So what you see is that the measurement is kind of very noisy uh, as soon as you increase the photon number. And in this region, you see that you have some information about the field, but the probability, the purity of the state is, is not very good. It's about 50%. The other thing is that you, you have some kind of ambiguity uh, 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 at the initial time, which is related to the fact that we perform a measurement modulo 8, which is ambiguous with respect to discriminating zero from eight photons. And here, it leads to completely absurd conclusion that after the first measurement, the estimator is thinking that the system contains eight photons. But at some point, eight, eight right, uh, 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 contains a vacuum. But indeed, it was not vacuum. It was eight photons, because at some point, the estimator has to consider that the photon is not anymore zero, but seven. And the probability to have a jump from zero to seven is, is very small. Which means that most probability, this estimation was wrong. And indeed, here it was 8. But you can only know it looking at the future. If you don't know that you have a jump to 7, you, you most probably you, you, you have 0. So that's why uh, this uh, formalism is kind of limited. And uh, it's obvious on, on this trace that it's important to take into account the future in order to have a better description of a given quantum trajectory at that point. So that's uh, what we did uh, I I I on this second figure. So I represent here only the backward probability. So here, I take no information from the past, but only the future. And you see that there is a lot of information uh, on the future. So I comment it starting uh, from uh, the right on the figure. Initially, the estimator for the backward probability is the unit matrix. So it's a flat distribution, completely ambiguous. And again, you have the ambiguity between uh, 0 and 8 photons. The system, the, the, the estimator does not know uh, how to distinguish between these two states. But once you do backward propagation, you get two, two kinds of information. You get atomic measurement. But atomic measurement does not tell you anything which discriminate between 0 and 8. So basically, when you go backwards, the, uh, the, the ambiguity between 0 and 8 is not lifted by the measurement. So what is lifting the degeneracy? It's the fact that you put also relaxation and backward relaxation in the estimator. And if you put backward relaxation, you know that if, if there is 0, you don't expect that there is any jump. If there is 8, you accept, expect to have quantum jumps. And then, uh, if you have quantum zone from 8, you go to, uh, to 9 or 6, uh, and then, or 7, and, and then the, the atomic uh, signal will make the difference. So the fact that when you go backward, you, 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 you have uh, this information, uh, indirect uh, information uh, through relaxation, means that after some time, the estimator eliminates this ambiguity and knows that no, it's not 8, but it is 0 photons. And then from now on, the, 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 the backward estimator is kind of properly initialized. And the backward prediction looks very much like the forward one, except at the beginning. And at the beginning, you win. Because when you go backward, you, you never uh, estimate that when you have 7, you can have a, a jump to 0. So you eliminate this, uh, this poor knowledge of the initial state by using the backward information. Of course, if you combine the two, you, 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 you expect to improve both ends. And that's what happens. But you not only improve the ends, but you improve the noise very much on all the quantum trajectories. So to estimate the noise, you can look at the fluctuation of the signal. But better look at the second part of the panel, which represents the probability of it represents the maximum probability, so the probability of the most probable photon number. And here, the most probable photon number was 0. 
<coughs> whereas uh, here it was uh, uh, about seven or eight. And you see that when you combine these uh, two signals for using the forward backward estimation, the noise I is very, very strongly reduced. So this kind, uh, thi this could uh, appear of, uh, as a kind of miracle, but it, it is not. It uh, relies to the fact that when you go forward, for example, every time you have a measurement, you have an additional information with its noise because it's a random event and it's a, a big perturbation of the system. When you operate the forward backward uh, formalism, you always take into account all measurements. So you don't have the addition of discrete information and this uh, produces a strong noise redu reduction. So not only the noise is reduced, but the purity of the number, the photon number is, is higher. Here you, you have a detection, you are sensitive up to eight photons with a, a, a purity larger than uh, 50%. So we apply this formalism uh, for observing not only uh, the relaxation of an initial field, here uh, we observe the relaxation of an initial coherent field injected in the cavity. We can also do another experiment, observe what I would call a hidden field. So let's assume that the cavity is in vacuum and low temperature so that thermal fluctuations are negligible and that we use an atom to emit a single photon at a given time. So we know that we put a photon by detecting the atom in the lower state of the transition. When we put an atom in upper state, perform a pi pulse, detect it in G, we expect to have one photon in the cavity. But we don't tell it to the estimator. So that's what I call the hidden uh, photon in the cavity. And we look how good is the estimator to detect this uh, uh, random, uh, photon number emission uh, using the different uh, approach. So here is time. Time origin is the, the emission time of the photon because we know it, but we don't tell it to the estimator. And you see that the green curve is the forward estimator, which has some delay to realize that the photon was emitted in the cavity. Of course, the estimator just have the, uh, for doing the estimation at time equals zero just knows the past, and in the past there was no photon. So there is no reason it starts to, 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 to grow up before zero. And so it jumps up, detects the photons, and after some time, the photon disappears because the cavity is not perfect and there is damping. But you see that the quantum jump uh, of the green line is also delayed with respect uh, to the other line. So what are the other line? The dotted line is the backward estimator, which have a similar noise, but have delay in the opposite direction for similar uh, reason. And uh, of course, you see obviously that the forward backward estimator is much better. It has much less noise and it just jumps at the right time in between the forward and backward estimation. Again, because it knows all the story uh, to the end at any time. <coughs> so here is the average over something like 3,000 such trajectories. So just to show that we can also uh, reconstruct very accurately the average. On average, the forward is delayed. The backward is advanced, and uh, you can uh, get information about this. This is an exponential fit of the data, uh, which is cut there, so that you can uh, check that you exactly measure the damping time of a single photon. So you measure the cavity damping time in this way with a single photon. And you can even estimate the photon number uh, at the emission time, which is indeed a little bit larger than one, because it's not easy to have exactly one atom in the emitting uh, uh, packet. And uh, sometimes you have two, and on average you have something like 1.3 uh, uh, atoms uh, emitting a photon, which is also an information uh, you, you get there. And, and the time of jumps is perfectly uh, well determined if you take uh, this, uh, uh, the, the time of the jump of the, of the rate curve. So another interesting uh, thing one, one can do uh, with the forward-backward analysis is to get some parameters uh, characteristic of the evolution of the system. And uh, what we can get from uh, analyze, analyzing the statistics of quantum jumps, indeed, uh, for example, uh, in this curve, where there is the, the probability of the most probable state as a function of time, you see that when you have five, with a probability, let's say, larger than 50%, we can estimate that, okay, this is a good five. 
And uh, this duration corresponds to the lifetime of this photon number. When you have a lot of trajectory, you can uh, do the statistics of quantum jumps and reconstruct the lifetime of individual photon number. So what, that's what is represented uh, on this scheme. The horizontal axis is the photon number. Vertical axis is lifetime. And what we expect from theory is that individual photon number have a lifetime, which is the cavity damping time divided by the photon number, which is a simple, which has a simple interpretation. Uh, it means that when you have n photons in, in the cavity, you have n times more probability to lose one as compared to the case where you have only a single photon. It's, it, it's like when you go fishing, if there are more fish, you have more probability to, go to, to, to fish one. So the data are the red points. The theory is a black uh, uh, points and line, corresponds to uh, the, 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 the theory, including the residual, small residual black body radiation in the cavity. So this uh, fits very well. And you know that, you, you see that if you, instead of using the past quantum state trajectory, you, you use the direct or, or backward trajectory, you can never get this information. The noise is too high and the error bars are huge and, and you have no information about that. So that's a, a very efficient way to get uh, parameters of the system. So for concluding uh, this, uh, I hope you understood that past quantum state analysis is a very efficient tool uh, for quantum state estimation. I should mention, so I did not have time to make a review uh, about other experiments, but there were other uh, experiments uh, using uh, this uh, formalism. So this is useful. It does not do anything, of course. It can only be used if you wait to the end of the story. But if you want to do something in, in real time, like quantum feedback, uh, you cannot. So uh, for the future, I, I should mention that we can generalize this approach to the first kind of state reconstruction I, I mentioned, which is a quantum state tomography. So in quantum state tomography, instead of making horizontal analysis of the state, you make a vertical one, taking the measurement performed at time t or just after time t. And indeed, uh, Pierre Rouchon uh, introduced uh, a formalism in which one can uh, use all information uh, detected after uh, time t not only to reconstruct the past quantum state, but to make quantum tomography using all this kind of information. And we, we would like very much to use this formalism to apply it in the experiment. For example, for uh, the experiment which is presently running in which we can, we, we try to prepare an entangled state of two cavities, which could be reconstructed, uh, reconstructed efficiently using uh, this uh, quantum tomography uh, formalism. So the other uh, things uh, we are presently doing is uh, uh, developing a new experiment uh, with slow atoms, slow Rydberg atoms. So why slow in Rydberg atoms? You have seen that fast Rydberg atoms are good to get, are already good to get a lot of information about the field. But of course, the, 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 the difference between the single atom interaction time and uh, the cavity damping time is so large and tens of microseconds as compared to hundreds of milliseconds, that it's obviously advantageous to try to have much longer atomic interaction time. And we are doing this by using slow atoms. So here is a signal we obtain uh, with atoms with a velocity of 10 meters per second. And the advantage when the atomic motion be become negligible in the cavity is that you have time to make the spectroscopy of the dress state. So that's something which is uh, well, uh, well done uh, for a long time with superconducting qubits. And now you have here one of the first signals we recently get, which is the spectroscopy. So this is the frequency of a microwave condition. This is the transfer rate between some uh, different Rydberg atoms. And you see peaks. So this is uh, a peak corresponding to the vacuum in the cavity, one, two, three, four, five photons in the cavity. And now we are using this for uh, doing a quantum Zeno uh, experiment in which setting the, the, the spectroscopy on one state, we can detect this state and only this state, and, and you use a, a quantum zeno dynamic to manipulate the field state in the cavity. So I think it's uh, uh, just time. So I had additional slides about another topic, but maybe I will skip them. And uh, I just uh, show you uh, the team uh, for conclusion. Of course, this work uh, is the work of a team. It's not a a single people team. So 
Uh, here is a nearly complete uh, picture of the prison steel with the cavity uh, QD team. The two cavity experiment is uh, performed uh, with uh, uh, in, in the group of Igor Gordotsenko, which is one of the young permanent of the group, and Sebastian Glaze is performing the experiment with the slow atoms. So the, the we have also two other experiments in the group, a superconducting atom chip experiment, which we are turning uh, into uh, uh, a spin, a one-dimensional spin chain uh, simulator, uh, now, uh, by manipulating Rydberg atoms without cavity. And uh, another experiment, which is a quantum metrology experiment, in which, again, we drop the cavity. So I, I don't know why, but maybe the cavity is the most difficult part of, of the experiment, and there are uh, interesting things to do with the atoms themselves. So the idea is that the Rydberg atom multiplicity with a given principal quantum number has a huge degeneracy. For n equal 50, you have 2,500 levels which means that you can uh, implement complex dynamic and qu com complex state preparation, and you can prepare states which are extremely sensitive either to electric fields or to magnetic fields. And just to give an example, if you make the superposition of a circular state rotating like that and the same circular state rotating in the opposite direction, you have a, a, a superposition of two states, two orbits, which are very different and which are very sensitive to magnetic fields because the difference uh, in, the, the, in, in, uh, in Bohr magneton is 100. So that's the kind of experiment that Sebastian uh, is uh, presently performing. And the collaboration, so I already uh, mentioned uh, Pierre Rouchon. Uh, we collaborate on quantum xenodynamics with Paolo Facci and Severio Pascasio, past quantum state Klaus Molmer, and on the speed chain, Guillaume Roux, who is here, and Thierry Jolicoeur from LPTMS. So thank you for your attention. Yes. And, and you have a, a most uh, probable uh, number of problems. Yes. What is your possible choice for the next five R, the phase of the second uh, five of the first, to get to extract uh, the maximum of information at the next measurement? Yes. So, so we did uh, an, an experiment about that. I, indeed, here, we, we, uh, I first mentioned that we don't use this any kind of optimal strategy. Here, it's just passive variation of phi R. So we, uh, we, we have a periodic settings so that we explore equally all photon numbers. <laughs> of course, if you have at some point, you have advantage to set the, the phase settings so that you have the better discrimination between the, the remaining states there. So it's interesting to, in real time, adjust the, the phase to have the, the optimal phase for the next measurement. So we made such an experiment uh, in which, at each step, we, we estimate uh, what is the best setting of the phase for the next measurement by minimizing the entropy. So at, at time t, we have the density operator of the system. We assume that we measure with some phi. We simulate the result, calculate the average entropy, and, and, and put the phase setting, which is optimal with respect to this. And then the, the convergence to, to a given photon number, for example, is, is faster. Uh, and the uh, information is ex extracted faster on the photon number with this strategy. It, 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 it's not very impressive. It's something like 20% uh, shorter. It's not impressive because the experiment was far uh, from being perfect. At that time, the, the, the cavity was not the best one. So the, the dumping time was reduced and relaxation was more important. The, the detector efficiency was reduced to 20%, whereas it can reach 80%. So it was not so impressive, but with better detector and better contrast of Ramsey fringes, it could be uh, an improvement of something like one order of magnitude. And in principle, three atoms should be enough. And there is a, 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 an adaptive measurement scheme, which in principle allows to detect up to eight photons, up to seven photons with only three atoms. So there is a, a big margin between 50 and, and three. Uh, but experimental limitation up to now where, where it was from.
Uh, okay, so we, we did not make the, the quantum fissure uh, information analysis uh, on, on this data. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the what you have to measure to get some parameters will depend on the parameters. Most probably for getting uh, the, the photon number damping time, measuring the photon number operator is probably uh, the optimal operator, but I have not a formal analysis. Maybe, maybe Pierre has some idea about that. Uh, so that's an interesting question. Maybe we have no. No. <laughs> so one more. Uh, and, uh, uh, is the time uh, from which you begin the fact with the calculation mm -hmm. critical or not? Because, uh, so the, the, the larger time, the better, because you have more information. But it's not very critical. You, you see that you, you have some uh, time which is more or less one measurement time. Uh, in which the, the, the backward is not very good because it, it, it still has the, the reminiscence of the flat distribution. But after that, this is good. So if you start backward from here, it will be good uh, at this point. All the. Even for the adjustment between forward and backward, it's not critical. So it's not, I, I think it's not critical. Of course, it is much more efficient to have a trajectory which goes to vacuum because vacuum is kind of robust point. And uh, we never tried to, to start it from here. Maybe it's not so good. So if you are working on it, you are not actually doing it in the cost effect. Okay, so mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, thank you.